Yes, I'm still here, Hollywood. And coming up on today's episode... I met Woody the night before uh, his audition. Woody says, uh, hey, uh, look, I'm auditioning for your show tomorrow. And I'm auditioning to replace the coach, be the new bartender. And I said, oh, man, that, uh, that's great. Well, my name's George. Uh, what's your name? He goes, Woody. And I said, oh, no, no, not the character name. What's your name? He goes, Woody. I'm a, uh, I, th- I think I might be seeing you tomorrow. I don't know. And uh, sure enough. Say, your nephew is Jason Sudeikis. Indeed he is. Did you have any advice for him when he got into the business? <laughs> I forget. It was Letterman or Conan or somebody said, did your uncle George have any advice for you? And Jason goes, yeah, he told me, uh, just get on the best show on television and uh, one of the greatest shows of all time and just pretty much take it from there. When you think about the biggest comedy shows in television history, there are always a few things that stand out. There's, of course, the writing, the ensemble cast, sometimes the music. And there's very often at least one character whose name resonates, staying in pop culture for decades. This fact is pretty much the norm. And it's that norm that I'm talking about. This is Still Here Hollywood. I'm Steve Kometko. Join me with today's guest, George Wendt. Norm from Cheers. George, do you miss Cheers? God, yes. Do you? You know how I know? How? I, I have dreams about it. <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty committed to a show. Yeah. I mean, it, and they're really happy dreams. You know, be like, we'll be sitting there and we'll be laughing hysterically, and Burroughs will say, Ah, that's great. That's great. Let's put it in the show. You know, and uh, then I wake up and there's no show to put it into. Uh, how long has this been going on? <laughs> well, I don't know. 1993, I guess. Were you drinking real beer on the set? Nope. Nope. No, it was non-alcoholic, uh, near beer, flat, warm, salty. Uh, yeah. Really uh, got you in the mood, huh? And then once in a while, um, towards the end of the evening, we we would you know shoot pickups of stuff that we only took one pass. Uh, so we had a list of pickups that that were a little dodgy. So uh, uh, at that point, we would ask the prop man to crack out the real beers, including the producers and writers and Burroughs and everybody. Yeah. Uh, was it like that? I remember there was a period of time because I was working for N- an NBC affiliate in Louisville, Kentucky, early in my career, and I remember when Cheers came on because it was so good right off the bat. It seemed to me, but I think they had difficulty finding an audience in the beginning. Uh, yeah, and it almost got canceled. Yeah, we were last, dead last in the ratings. What fixed it? Nothing. Uh, time, you know, uh, letting. Uh, okay. Grant Tinker and Brandon Tartikoff, in their wisdom, you know, uh, decided to abandon the develop, you know, pilot, order, cancel, cycle, uh, and just trust the the creators and the material and uh, leave it there until the audience found it. Because uh, I mean, they were last for maybe a decade, you know, in the three at three networks at the time. So uh, you know, that's when why they hired Grant Tinker, because of his quality work at MTM. And uh, so he put on like you know, Saint Elsewhere, Cheers, um, you know, Family Ties. Just you know, he had a relationship with Gary Goldberg, and and so you know, it, it was. Uh, History proved uh, that it worked out for him. And for Cheers. And for Cheers. And Brandon Tartikoff was in my first workshop at Second City. Oh, really? Yeah. How long ago was that? 70s? 73. 73, yeah. He, he was an executive. I didn't know this. He was just my friend from workshop. Yale guy, my age. You know, I was like, Oh, this guy's cool, and you know we had a lot of a lot of fun together, and then he disappeared one day, and I was like, hmm, "What happened to Brandon?" Well, what happened to Brandon was he was uh, 
you know, a, a, a junior executive at WLS, the O and O, uh, ABC station, and um, Fred Silverman was at ABC at the time, and he called him to New York, and that's why. Well, oh, it sucks. He was my boy, and uh, then you know, <laughs> years later. How much do you think uh, starting out at Second City helped your career? Look, it was my, the entire uh, it was the entirety of my experience on stage. The entirety of it. I, I had nothing going on before that. And it's funny because uh, we in the workshops had this uh, little showcase at a, a church down the road from Second City on Saturday nights, and uh, Brandon and I were were um, too green. To uh, to be you know on stage, but we wanted to be on board, so he volunteered to uh, sell coffee and cookies, and I volunteered to uh, set up and break down the folding chairs and stuff. And um, one night there was this triumphant show, and uh, the audience just buzzing. And as they're filing out, I'm Brandon's breaking down the coffee and cupcakes and whatever, and. <laughs> And uh, I'm breaking down the folding chairs, and he goes, George, one of these days, it's going to be me and you up there. Turned out to be true, um, only it was like 100 million people. <laughs> Small crowd. Yeah. Um, Second City has such a reputation. Yeah. Uh, I took a couple of writing classes there. Oh, great. Writing the humorous memoir. I yeah. didn't have enough of a sense of humor. Who, who taught you? Nancy Beckett. I'm still in touch with her. Nice. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun, um, and she was very encouraging. Good. Let me go back to Cheers for a second. Uh, do you have uh, fond memories of Kirstie Alley? Funny memories of Kirstie Alley. Oh my God, she was a pistol. Man, she was. Yes, she was uh, just hilarious, and you know, kind of. Out of her mind in a in the best possible way. <laughs> Something you know it was very necessary for uh, you know where we were all at. She was. You heard the story about um, our opening night gift. No. Well, you know we've all we're all pretty wrapped up in ourselves, and one night we're at dinner before the sh sh for Kirsty's first shoot, and uh, she wasn't in the room. And um, I guess, I don't know, Ted, John, me, Rhea, Woody, uh, were, were there. And, 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 you know, oh, God, should we get Kirsty something? I mean, it's now 5 or 6 o'clock. And um, we're like, oh, yeah. You, nobody thought of that yet? And it's like, no, what? Flower? No, no. Um, geez, what are we? Um, and so je we, we should go get her something. And... Uh, you know, Ted's like, I got to do a thing, and I can't do it. I, Woody, I had a thing, Rhea. So John and I go, well, all right, we'll, we'll go look for something. So we get in my car, and, and we're driving down Melrose, you know, trashy lingerie and, you know, like uh, crazy stores. and we're like, Wig nah, shops. No, yeah, no, no. And um, we pulled up, and there was a big five on the right sporting goods store and John goes you want to <laughs> you want to buy her a shotgun and I laughed for about five minutes and then I said yeah let's do it and so we and that's how easy it was in those days we walked into big five and no questions asked bought a, a shotgun and uh boxed it up and I guess we might have had it wrapped and um you know, when the cast found out that that's what we got, I mean, everyone was horrified. Uh, <laughs> you can't do that. And Kirsty, of course, loved it. And uh, but the good news, okay, the good news was Kirsty loved it, and the better news was John and I were never sent on a shopping mission <laughs> again. That is good news. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs that responsibility? Yeah. Uh, and Coach. You lost Coach very early on. Yeah. I thought he was such a terrific 
uh, character. Yes. And who would have thought that you'd bring in Woody Harrelson and he would work out as well as he did? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I met Woody the night before uh, his audition. Randomly, I was at Gelson's, and uh, I saw these two young guys giggling and pointing at me, and and uh, we were on the air about two, three years at that point, so I was getting a little used to that. And one's pushing the other one towards me, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> and, and um, <laughs> and uh, then finally he prevails, the kid pushing, and Woody says, uh, hey, uh, look, I'm auditioning for your show tomorrow. My friend thought I should say hello. Uh, uh, I'm auditioning to replace the coach, be the new bartender. And I said, oh, man, that uh, that's great. Well, man, have fun with that. That's, uh, that's uh, go get him, you know? And he goes, yeah, thanks. I said, uh, well, my name's George. What's your name? He goes, Woody. And I said, oh, no, no, not the character name, because I knew that, that the writers had, I knew that there was a character from Indiana, Woody Boyd. I said, no, no, not the character name. What, what's your name? He goes, Woody. I went, I, th- I think I might be seeing you tomorrow. I don't know. And uh, sure enough. And he fed in beautifully. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And now he has this huge movie career. Yeah. And look back at Nicky Colasanto's movies, too. You know, like Fat City and Raging Bull. And he, he was he was amazing. It's been a while since Cheers went off. It was on for, what, 11 years? Yep. It's been a while since it's gone off the air. Um, well, it's never really been off. Well, true. Reruns. Thank God for reruns. Uh, how many people still call you Norm? Oh, not that many. Uh, you know, I, I look so much older and different. Um, uh, my little brother, on the other hand, though, looks exactly like Norm. And he's like 14 years younger than me, so... Uh, do you think being so closely identified with Norm during the run of the show kept you from other jobs? Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. I mean, I mean, there's plenty of examples, you know, of people who it did not keep from, you know, like Woody. You know, looking through your list of credits in IMDb, have you ever done that? It's very long. Yeah. Well, you know. I, I, Oh, man, I get to say this now. I'm in this business 50 years. You know, like um, I used to laugh at those guys. I'm in this business 50 years, and these kids today, that's not funny. I know funny. I'm in this business 50 years. That's not funny what they're doing today. Um, Anyway, yeah, me, 19, uh, I'm going to count from workshops with Brandon, uh, 1973, uh, yeah. And also, I joined Actors Equity in uh, 1974 when I got hired in the touring company at Second City. So that is uh, bang on 50 years professionally. Say, your nephew is Jason Sudeikis. Indeed he is. Did you have any advice for him when he got into the business? <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny because uh, he, he gets asked that a, a lot. Oh, does he? Yeah, and I, I saw... Um, I forget, it was Letterman or Conan or somebody, said, did your Uncle George have any advice for you? And Jason goes, he's so, he's so sharp. He goes, uh, yeah, he told me, uh, just get on the best show on television and uh, one of the greatest shows of all time and just pretty much take it from there. And he goes, so I did. And he got on SNL. And And Ted Lasso has secured him very if he wasn't before, he's he's now a fixture. Yeah. On TV. Yep. Well deserved. Well, I think so too. Oh, he's such a great kid. Yeah, you know, kid. He's forty five or something. I don't know. That's a kid. Yeah. My uh, my uh, godson. I'm very proud. Proud, especially you know, not only the success, but he's so. Have you read profiles and stuff? I mean, he's so. Such a mensch, so smart, so thoughtful. I mean, it all comes out in the show, right? Right. We'll be back in a moment. But the better story 
is uh, Ratzenberger. He goes in for Myra and it's with George. You can tell it's not going too well. And so uh, they're going, well, thank you. And he's like, yeah, thank you. And he starts to go for the door and, and he pops his head back into the room and he goes, do you guys have a bar know-it-all? And they go, no, no, what do you, what do you mean? And he started uh, improvising as this uh, Cliff Clavin character and they wrote it in. How close were you to the character of Norm? I had to look like a guy who uh, wanted another beer. I'm like, that I can do. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, there wasn't a whole, I didn't have to put a lot of mustard on anything. It was pretty much just uh, me with material supplied by some of the best, you know, comedy writers in Hollywood uh, of the era. It was murderers row. I mean, we had, every day of the week, we had all these Paramount guys, you know, Jerry Belson, Levine and Isaacs, David Lloyd. Yeah, it was, it was just great. Do you keep in contact with uh, your castmates, your former castmates? Do you ever yeah. run into them? All of them, yeah, I do. I mean, it's hard to get together, you know, because... So much is going on. Yeah. <laughs> we all have families and, and you know, yeah. But, um, yes, I do. I'm, I'm in touch with everybody. Do you have any projects in the works? Anything you want to do? Uh, not really. Um, you know, I mean, yes, there are projects in the works, but... You know, that's that's so amorphous unless, you know, it's like, you know, a set-up movie or something, you know. That, uh, and, you know, like I, I get things like, uh, hey, what if we got this element and that element? Would you be interested? And it's like, eh, it's a few steps down the road from anything being set up. So it's hard to, uh, you know, say this is the one. Uh, so yeah, the answer is uh, various irons in the fire. None of them are going to burn your fingers. <laughs> what made you want to get into the business to begin with? I didn't. All I wanted to do was be in Second City. Yeah, I was so so green, so dumb. I had no. Uh, I, I'm really thankful, de facto, that I had such a short term goal. Um, focused. I just was wanted to not. I wanted to. Ha I didn't want to be in a job that I hated for the rest of my life, so I started using the process of elimination. You know, doctor, no, I couldn't possibly. Scientist, no. Teacher, no. Sales, no. You know, and I just went down the list, policeman, fireman, whatever, cowboy. I mean, I couldn't, um, nothing. I, I, I knew I would hate everything. So then on one day I thought of um, being at Second City, and I thought, wow, if I could do that, I bet I wouldn't hate it. And I'm pretty sure they get paid. <laughs> and uh, so I... I you know, I, I sort of uh, called the box office, and they loved that. Uh, <laughs> asked about the workshops, and they said, uh, well, uh, give us your address. We'll send you a flyer. 13 weeks, 85 bucks, Tuesday nights. And uh, it's 6 or something. We were out by 8. And uh, the show started at 9 back then, cabareting, you know. Uh, start, they started at eight now. They start more like a theater now, but um, and I don't even know what Second City is anymore. But um, back then it was it was a blast. I had fun, and it wasn't really until you know I'd been there working, and uh, then you know they they called from like Leo Burnett or something and said, "Hey, can you send the people some of the cast over for?" 
uh, you know, we're going to do some commercials or we're going to have a, some demos for commercials, that sort of thing. And they said, well, you have to join SAG. I'm like, what? what okay, I guess, yeah, sure. And then, you know, this other project was, oh, yeah, you got to join after and on. It's like, oh, okay. So here I am, a member of SAG after an equity. And I go, well, I guess I'm an actor. I mean, it really went in a, you know, in reverse. It was weird. Now that you've been an actor for 50 years, yep. um, can you think back or can you think about anybody who you wish you could have worked with? Do yeah. you have who? Uh, lots. Oodles. Um, I mean, I didn't really have the opportunity, mind you, but I was in this project, um, Alice in Wonderland, and uh, I was Tweedledee or Tweedledum, I can't remember. We called him Tweedledum and Tweedledum. Or, um, uh, with Robbie Coltrane was my brother, and uh, it was fun. We had a blast. But um, it was a big star-studded cast. Uh, Marty Short was the Mad Hatter and whatnot. And Ustinov, Peter Ustinov was the um, walrus. And one day, I never met him. And then one day, we're, you know, driving in a transportation van at Pinewood Studios outside of London or wherever it was. And uh, and I see Ustinov standing on a street corner. I'm like, and I practically dove out of the van. And, uh, but I couldn't you know, get it open. And, um, how do you roll down the window? And, um, uh, so there he was. Uh, but I thought he was awesome. Never met him. But we were in a movie together. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can always point to that. Yeah. You and, you know, to. that was what, one of the fun things about multicam comedy or, you know, sitcoms, um, uh, you know, rest in peace, <laughs> so to speak. But, uh, you know, we were with, everybody was in every day. Um, so, you know, you got to meet, like, you know, somebody working with you, you you got to hang out with them for like a week, as opposed to a drive-by with Peter Houston off, like. Oh, it's better than nothing. Yeah. Um, are there other uh, Second City stars that you worked with who came up through the ranks? Yeah, lots and lots. Shelley Long was yes, in. Yes, Shelley was there with uh, in the same time. Uh, you know, uh, Tim Kazarinsky, Mary Gross. Uh, Mary Gross, I saw her once in, long before she went to work at SNL and other shows and yeah. films. Yeah. Uh, Jim Belushi. Uh, others, you know, like uh, Don DePaul. Yeah, they're not... Not so many uh, Harold Ramises and um, John Belushi's, and, although they were my idols. John Candy, got to work with him. That was a blast. I think Joan Rivers did a stint at Second City oh, too. Oh sure, yeah, a everybody. Elaine May. Mike you didn't Nichols. wait a minute. You weren't there. You weren't <laughs> no, there. no. See, like you're like the only person in <laughs> show business that didn't <laughs> claim Second City. Well. Just took a class, that's all. Yeah. Um, do, do you remember how you felt the morning after you knew Cheers was ending? Well, I was ill from, for some, the boys, Glenn and Les and Jimmy, were into cigars at the time. So they were passing out these huge Cuban, illegal at the time, cigars at the rap party and, uh, you know, I'm not a smoker, and I did. You know, I just thought it was cool, and uh, I got completely turned green from uh, inhaling cigar smoke. Are you? So, are, you're not supposed to inhale, are you? You know, <laughs> but uh, you know, just after a while, it just builds up. I think, you know, because everyone was smoking it. Here's a question: I'll bet no one's ever asked you. What do you think about the Met Gala? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't understand fashion, and uh, you know, I, my daughter is uh, involved in uh, the apparel design, 
and uh, she could probably explain it a lot better. Um, but there's that great speech by, I guess it was Meryl Streep, the uh, Amanda Priestley mm -hmm. character in Devil Wears Prada. Thank you. Um, yeah, and that made a lot of sense in the, in the movie. I don't remember any of it, but um, I think it's where she's talking about the color cerulean blue, and or and and but like why why fashion yes, is important, right? Right. It, you know, in a real big way, comprehensive way. But it's kind of ludicrous, isn't it? Well, sometimes I think it's kind of uh, overblown. It's not like they're going to wear these clothes again. No, I don't never. know if it really counts as fashion per se. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they're not going out the next night in the same clothes. No, but it, I think in part of, uh, well, so, okay, folks, anyone watching, look up the Miranda Priestly, uh, anyway, um, because she, it makes a lot of sense what, how it, yes, n none of this is going to be worn, but it's part of something much bigger. And I forget what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you remember your audition process for Cheers? Was there an audition? I do. I do. I've got a good story there for you. It doesn't involve me. Um, but uh, my end was uh, my agent called and said, uh, okay, I was on this other show with Gary Goldberg called Making the Grade, Paramount Show, different networks, CBS. Um, and... Uh, we had just done six as a mid-season sort of tryout, six episodes. And uh, so then uh, my agent calls and says, uh, yeah, these guys from Cheers, they want you to come in and do a thing. Um, it's really small role, though, i got to tell you. I go, oh, okay, and I'm flattered, you know. And so I, uh, wh wh how small is it? And she said, well, it's kind of one line. And I go, oh, okay. It's actually, um, you know, come to think of it, it's one word. I go, oh, really? <laughs> You're not going to believe it. It's one syllable. <laughs> and I go, okay, what is it? Uh, and she goes, beer. So the bit was, it was to be the tag at the end of the, the pilot episode, which never really happened to the tag part. Um, but... Shelly was going to, uh, I was going to be her, her first customer. Hello, my name is Diane. I'll be your waitress. Well, I'm not really a waitress. I'm an academic. And she goes on for a page. And I'm just sitting there like, uh-huh. And uh, she goes, oh, I'm sorry. I should take your order. What can I get you? And I go, beer. And she goes, beer. Perfect. And that was the end of the episode. Uh, and so... The casting director, uh, the late Stephen Kolzak, said, you know, that that's one word that's too small to read for the guys. Um, here, read this other. And uh, the role is George, and uh, it's a guy who, uh, you know, wants another beer. And, um, well, they I read it, and they offer it to me. And, um, you know, I... I uh, at first, uh, Paramount said, well, sure, you, why don't we see if you can do both? And um, But CBS said no. So they said, well, let's bring you on for the pilot as a guest. And uh, if Making the Grade, this other show, gets picked up, uh, it, you know, we'll recast. And um, if it doesn't, you know, we'll probably, you know, keep you. And... Um, so then, like 20 years, maybe 10 years ago, like way, way, way later, I found out uh, that they kind of had me in mind when they wrote it. And I was like, I had no idea. And because uh, it was named George, right? And uh, they, they had worked with, I did a taxi. And I guess, uh, you know, I guess they thought maybe I'd be right for this norm and um, so it, I went to they invited me to come to a symposium at UCSB 
uh, with the Charles brothers and Jim Burroughs. And they said, why don't you come and uh, you'd be like a surprise guest about halfway through the program. And so people are going, and I'm sitting in the wing watching, and people are going, now did you have anybody in mind when you were uh, writing Cheers? And they were like, oh my God, no, oh, oh. We saw everybody in Hollywood and New York and Chicago. We it, meticulous mix and match chemistry. That was Sam and Diane, right? And they go, but Rhea, we, we did have Rhea in mind, and George. And I'm like, the, the hell? That's kind of flattering. In a way, I'm glad I never knew that. But the better story is uh, Ratzenberger. He goes in for my role, for George. <laughs> he uh, he had been, was new in town, and he'd been working a lot in the UK uh, for ten years or so. You can tell it's not going too well, and so uh, they're going well. Thank you, and he's like, yeah, thank you, and he starts to go for the door, and literally, not figuratively, literally has one foot out the door and he pops his head back into the room and he goes, do you guys have a bar know-it-all? And they go, no, no, what do you, what do you mean? And he started uh, improvising as this uh, Cliff Clavin character and they wrote it in. That's not a bad, great story. Huh? No, not That's bad at good all. Spot, yeah. George, thanks for doing this. Still here, Hollywood, I appreciate it. Oh, man, yeah, my pleasure, it was fun. Still Here Hollywood is a production of the Still Here Network. All things technical run by Justin Zangerly. Theme music by Brian Sanishin. And executive producer is Jim Lichtenstein. <laughs>